Hey guys, I am Butch Theory, the host of the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report, and it is Christmas week. We are going to release a special show for you guys. We're not going to be able to record the usual fishing report this week for obvious reasons. People uh, traveling and just relaxing and trying to get in some of that family time. The guys over at Northwest Florida Fishing Report, Joe Baia, and the Alabama Freshwater Fishing Report, Brian Sin, recorded an awesome show last week with field marketing manager at Johnson Outdoors, Bill Carson. He, um, very knowledgeable gentleman. They did an awesome show called Choosing the Best Fish Finder for Your Type of Fishing. So you guys enjoy that show. I was not able to record that with them due to scheduling conflicts and just life in general being crazy. We hope you guys have a very Merry Christmas and an awesome new year. Be safe. Talk to you next year. You guys keep whacking them. Hey guys, and welcome to another special episode from the Great Days Outdoors Podcast Network. I'm your host, Joe Baia from the Northwest Florida Fishing Report here with my co-host, Brian Sin from the Alabama Freshwater Fishing Report. And Brian, this week we are going to be talking about something that has, you know, technology, all kinds of technology have come leaps and bounds in the last couple of decades. And we're going to be digging in pretty deep this week on choosing the best fish finder for your type of fishing. I mean, I know you're, you're in the market right now trying to uh, buy a fish finder for your dad, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I've been looking forward to this show, not only to get some insight on, on what I need to look at for my dad for Christmas, you know, 80 years old, technically challenged to say the least, but every week on Alabama Freshwater Fishing Report, there's never a week that electronics doesn't come up. I mean, it plays such a vital key role and, and these professional anglers, they're doing this for a living. I mean, they, you know, a lot of them came up like me. They were old school. They started fishing before electronics. But it's one of those things that once you learn it and get good quality electronics and learn how to use it, you can't go back. I mean, you just can't, you can't do what you do without it. It's that, it's that big of a tool. And so I have been just really, really looking forward to this um this podcast and to having bill on because it's going to be it's something that our listeners are anxious to hear no doubt well first thing we're going to do is kind of try to get some of the definitions some of the jargon out of the way because there's a lot of technical terms that come up and i think that's where a lot of people glaze over so we're going to try to break that down into you know usable definitions we're going to get into why one type of of uh one type of unit or transducer is preferred over another uh, and then we're going to wrap it over, wrap it up with trying to really help you select the best type of fish finder for your kind of fishing. Because I mean, your guys are doing crappie, largemouth bass, striped bass in the big reservoirs. My guys down here, they're fishing for inshore, offshore, and all different types of scenarios. And really, there is no one size fits all approach. I don't think we're going to learn that today. The expert uh, we've got joining us today is Bill Carson. Bill is the field marketing manager at the Johnson Outdoors Fishing Group. Bill, welcome to the show, man. Tell us a little bit about your role at Johnson Outdoors. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm really glad and honored to be here. Um, my role at Johnson Outdoors, and I've been here, uh, it'll be nine years uh, coming up the first of, of the year here in uh, 2021. And my role is to uh, support all of the Humminbird, Minn Kota, and Cannon efforts in the field. Um, I really kind of focus on saltwater because I'm responsible for saltwater uh, pro staff. And then I also run the college program for our organization and started that program uh, back at the very genesis of BASS specific to the tournament series who runs a college program. I've been to every college event uh, that BASS has held regionally as well as the championships since the inception of that. And I, I, I really touch on that because these kids are very near and dear to all of our hearts and, and should be because they're the next generation of uh, fishermen and fisherwomen uh, for us in the, in the fishing world. And, you know, part of that role is to try to teach these ladies and gentlemen how to utilize the equipment and what the differences are of the equipment. And part of that is because the one thing that I realize is that 80% of the fishermen out there don't know how to use 20% of the piece of electronic. Um, and my goal is not to be a better fisherman than those people because I'm not, I'm okay. 
but at the end of the day, I know how to use the electronics and I know what to use for what. Um, if I knew how to fish like some of these people did with the electronic knowledges that I've gained over my tenure in the industry, um, I'd probably be pretty deadly as a fisherman. The, the technology continues to move at an incredible rate. You hear these jargons in other industries about artificial intelligence and the fish finder after all is just a computer. And so what's happening is, is we're trying to keep it as simple as we can. And we're trying to provide a tool with accessories that can be added onto that tool or those tools uh, that can help them do more catching while they're out fishing. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the tug on the line, right? Yeah, no doubt. And you know, I think what you're saying is important right there. If you're a good fisherman, you can be a good fisherman without electronics, period. But when you give someone who's a good fisherman electronics that are top of the line, it's like jet fuel. You know, I mean, it's just then they start to see all the opportunities and the ways that they can use these electronics to take their already good fishing skill to the next level. I don't I don't think that, you know, a person who's a novice fisherman is going to necessarily be able to. Uh, become an expert just because they've got the fanciest electronics. But the other thing that you said that really stuck out to me is I think about my iPhone. I'm really good at sending text messages, emails, and calling people. But I know this thing can do a lot more than than what I use it for. And And I'm sure electronics are the same way. So to start things out, let's try to get everyone on the same page when it comes to understanding the different components of a fish finder and break it down, you know, let's just talk about the different components first and foremost. So what are those decision points when someone's looking at setting up their boat with electronics? Well, one of the first things that happens is you have a group of people that come in and they don't want to spend a lot of money and they just want a quote unquote fish finder. Um, You ask them about GPS. They're not interested in GPS. They just want a fish finder. So The very simplest form of sonar is just a 2D sonar, and all it does is it sends out a sound signal out of the transducer, uh, typically at the stern of the boat. It can be on the trolling motor, and it catches that signal when it comes back in. It's like an upside-down ice cream cone, basically uh, starting out the size of a pinhead that's coming out of the transducer, and because that's a round-shaped disc, that's in there that sends out the signal, it makes it be like an upside down ice cream cone. And as a general rule, most of these sonars are utilizing transducers that are uh, emitting a 20 degree cone angle at its best signal strength, ship sending out and catching coming back. And what that means to the angler is that what they're seeing at the bottom is a third of the distance to the bottom, at the bottom. So if I'm in 30 feet of water, at the bottom, if you imagine this upside down ice cream cone coming out of the back of the of the boat in 30 feet of water, I'm seeing a 10 foot circle at the bottom. Now, is it exactly 10 foot? You never see anything outside of it? No, not exactly. But that's why a lot of times, instead of seeing an arch, you'll just see like part of an arch because that fish wasn't in the center of that upside down ice cream cone, wherever he passed through, he was just at the edge of it. So it wasn't a good signal. And that's why you don't see uh, that arch. So that's the first one. Uh, and if you want to learn to understand the size of the fish that you have at the, at the, at, on just a regular 2D sonar, let me give you a, interject one little tip right here. And that is when you catch a fish on whatever your sonar is and you want to understand what that size fish looks like. Let's say it's a three pound bass and you're a bass fisherman, or let's say it's a one pound crappie, crappy sockele white perch, whatever you call it, and you wanna target that fish, take that fish and put that fish on a piece of fishing line and make that piece of fishing line like maybe five or six feet long and tie it off onto the cleat of your boat or hold on to it with your hand and in, in a close proximity to your transducer and let that fish swim back and forth underneath your transducer and look what that fish that you already know the size of it looks like on your sonar. And that's going to teach you a lot about the size of the fish that you're seeing on your 2D sonar. That's That's great. Yeah, That's a great suggestion. So the next level of what everyone talks about 
is going to be uh, the GPS. Remember that first guy, he didn't want the GPS. Well, I see that as a problem, not because I want to sell you something that's more expensive, but because when I find whatever that is that's holding fish, or I find that group of bait, or I find that group of fish, I want to be able to go back to that same spot. Maybe I want to go back to that same spot in five minutes after I've caught two or three fish and the wind's blown me off of it because I didn't have a spot lock trolling motor. Uh, but the bottom line is, is I want to get back to that same spot. Or maybe it's a spot that's a piece of structure that I want to be able to come back to and I want to be able to fish it effectively the next time I come out, assuming that there's still bait and fish on it. But the bottom line is, historically what we did was we looked at this radio tower and we looked at this dock. Maybe the radio tower was directly in front of us and the dock with the flag on it was directly out to the side of the boat. And I knew that when I lined up on that particular triangulation, if you will, that I was somewhere really close to the spot. Now I do circles and I look for whatever the spot is. Okay, with a GPS, I can mark a waypoint where I see something and I can go back to that very same something. And I'm going to relate this to a saltwater application because that one's a really easy one to understand. I'm out in the Gulf of Mexico. I found this, this barge that's turned upside down on the bottom in the Gulf of Mexico, and I want to effectively fish that barge. So now what I do is I go by that barge, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit here to my side imaging, where I went by that barge to start with, and I marked all four corners of that barge. All I had to do is move my cursor over to one corner and mark it, the other corner mark it, the other corner mark it, the other corner mark it, so I have all four corners of that barge marked. Or on the Solix machine, I can, I can just touch and hold my finger on it, drop a waypoint. But the bottom line is, is I now know exactly how that piece of structure is lying on the bottom, so I can effectively fish it. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a bit when we're talking about some of the more detailed technologies. But for the purpose of this, I can utilize those waypoints to go back to that spot that was a hot spot once in my lifetime of fishing at this particular reservoir or on this ocean in this area and be able to replicate the success, assuming that the fish are there when I come back to it. Okay. Yeah. So down imaging and what down imaging does is down imaging gives me a very thin slice. The, the, the width of, or, or, or the depth from front to back of what that down imaging transducer is seeing and drawing on my machine is about the thickness of a business card, the long side of a business card, because the transducer elements that are in the DI portion of a down imaging transducer, that's about how long they are for purpose of illustration is about the long side of a business card. And it's almost like it's just lopped off at the front and lopped off at the back. It's not like a round circle, like what comes out of a 2D sonar. It is a little bit wider than the cone area of coverage side to side on the 2D sonar. So you're gonna see things on down imaging that you may not see on 2D sonar. But the down imaging, because of the way that it works, it gives me the ability, assuming that the water is shallow enough to be able to utilize it, which depending on which frequency you're looking at, will determine how deep the water is that you can look at. But for purposes of conversation, I could be out in the Gulf of Mexico, I could be in state waters, 120, 130, 140 feet of depth, and down imaging, is going to do something for me, okay? Now I'm going to move on up to the side imaging, and the illustration I gave about the barge on the bottom, that's where side imaging comes into play. It doesn't have to be in the ocean and be a barge on the bottom. It can be a brush pile. There are plenty of people that put brush piles out there. If they look at a man-made lake that's made by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, then what they do is they go in and they clear up, they clean up from the shoreline all the way down to what is going to be the 100-year drought uh, mark as a general rule. They're not going to landscape it like you would your front yard, but they're going to cut down trees that would impair uh, safe navigation. They're going to put shoal markers on, on rock outcroppings and reefs that stick up in the middle of the lake or coming off of a point 
or what have you. But the bottom line is they're going to have cleaned it up. I'm going to liken that to Lake Lanier because that's my home lake. Uh, lake Lanier at its deepest point is about 155 feet. It's 38,000 acres. It was backed up in 1957. Um, the 100-year drought mark for Lake Lanier is about 35 feet. So as they started to fill that lake up, they went around with a barge, or barges, and they had multiple chainsaw operators on the barges, and they utilized a tug to push that barge up against groups of trees, and all those guys did was cut the tops of those trees off as close to the water line as they could and let them tumble over on top of the trunks of the trees so that in the event the lake got down to that 100-year drought mark, that they would have some sort of a safe navigational opportunity on that particular um, lake. How does that work for me as an angler that's a freshwater angler? I would go to Lake Lanier and I never put a brush pile out there because I'm not a bass fisherman. I'm a striped bass guy or occasionally a crappie guy. But I could go use my side imaging and I could ride around on a 35 foot contour and only look at the side going back to the bank on side imaging. And I could see anything that showed up as a shadow on my side imaging, I could move my cursor or my finger over and I could actually mark that. And I now have more brush piles or rock piles or foundations of buildings or whatever it is than you could shake a stick at. And now whenever I go out there to fish and I find a fish on a particular piece of structure in a particular depth with our lake master charts, I could literally highlight that depth and only go fish those waypoints that I have marked in that particular depth band. That's eliminating a ton of water and giving me an incredible opportunity for success, right? I like what you're saying there about eliminating a ton of water. That's the name of the game. Whenever you're trying to break down a brand new piece of water, you're trying to break down, if you're a hunter, you're trying to break down a big block of woods and figure out what is going to congregate the animals. Where where are they going to be? It's the same thing in the Gulf of Mexico. You're talking about a huge expanse of water. There's reefs out there. There's there's different structures. There's natural bottom that all hold fish. You've got to be able to break and find those places, figure out where to focus. And then once you're there, you're talking about what the GPS feature, being able to mark a spot that you find, whether you're going to fish it that day or not. You may be trolling. You may be you know just cruising to your next spot. You see something, you mark it. You can come back to it in the future. I want to bring you back to the transducer conversation because you talked about 2D sonar. And if I understood you correctly, we're talking the decision point is between 2D sonar and down imaging. Is that accurate, what I just said? So you, so you have three opportunities for you. You can buy, you can buy sonar units uh, with GPS. You can buy uh, sonar down imaging units with GPS. And then you can buy side imaging units which have all of or both of the aforementioned uh, technologies are always going to be built into a side imaging unit. I, I can tell you that I, I know one of the things that you ask about besides giving definitions of units in terms of transducers and capabilities, you talk about utilizing or choosing the correct unit. I can say that if it were me and I were picking out a unit and I was pulling my money out of my wallet that I earned the hard way, I would never consider getting anything other than a side imaging unit as my first choice for the type of sonar that I would utilize. And again, I go back to that, not just being able to mark the structure, but you think about the illustration that I gave you in the very beginning when I'm looking at that upside down ice cream cone on that 2D sonar and I'm in 30 feet of water, I can only see 10 feet of bottom. So how many times in 30 feet of water do you spook a fish out from underneath the boat or you don't have the opportunity to look out to the side of the boat and see something that you wouldn't otherwise see? And, I, and, and I'm going to, I have your email address, so I'm going to send you a couple of screen snapshots at some juncture. Uh, you may be able to utilize them in some other graphical way for your podcast promotional uh, piece. But I can tell you this. Last weekend, I was on the water, and I was fishing in about 30 feet of water in the back of a creek where there was tons of bait. There were probably eight or nine boats that were in a close proximity to me. They were all fishing live bait for striped bass. 
I was not. I'm not much of a live bait fisherman. I don't mind doing it, but I love artificial fishing. Now, some people would call what I do not artificial fishing because I'm a big troller. I was using umbrella rigs to catch striped bass, and where I'm seeing these guys catch, you know, four, five, six, eight, ten fish as a general rule during their outing, we boated almost 40 stripers. And I give all of the credit to side imaging because as I'm going along in that 30 feet of water, instead of just looking at that 10 feet at the bottom underneath the boat, I'm looking out to the side of the boat, 150 feet, and I'm seeing big schools of striped bass that are out to the side of my boat, not even under my boat, for whatever the reason is. I just missed them. My engine spooked them, whatever. But because I had umbrella rigs back 100 feet behind the boat, I was able to turn 90 degrees, juice up my engine so that my umbrella rigs didn't dump on the bottom, and then straighten back up after 60 or 70 feet and pull my umbrella rigs right through there, and I was catching a fish on three or four rigs, boom, 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 just one second or two after the other because of the difference in links out to keep them from getting tangled, and it was all because of side imaging. Side imaging is the most important, valuable tool that has ever come along in fishing. That's very interesting, Bill, and I'm just thinking as far as myself, or if you're a bass guy, crappie guy, no matter what, the way that you're using this, are you, let's say you're just kind of trolling along looking for fish and you're using your side image at that point. Once you see fish with the side imaging, then let's say the fish are in, you're a crappie fisherman, you see the fish, a school of crappie on a brush top, on your side imaging, you go to it, then do you go to your down imaging? Is that kind of how you work them in conjunction? No, actually, if I'm a crappie guy, I go to a different technology than all of these. It's an accessory, and it's called uh, Mega360. Um, It gives me that side imaging without moving the boat. So in order to get a really good picture of what's out to the side of the boat with side imaging, I have to be moving because what it does is it's shooting that beam out, and it's dissecting what's out to the side of the boat in those long side of the business card bites as I move along and giving me incredible detail, but I have to be moving in order to do that. It's like taking a um, picture burst where your trail cam on your deer at your deer feeder is taking it. You, you, you don't want it to take a picture every time something comes into the beam of it. You want to space that out 30 seconds or 45 seconds or a minute or you keep getting the same picture of the same deer with side imaging as I'm, I'm, as I'm going by it, it's just taking those little bitty slices and it's giving it back to me with 360. So here's the application for side imaging and the mega 360, because you brought up uh, crappy fishing. I do crappy fish in the springtime. I do like to eat cold water crappy um, out of Lake Lanier. I only like to keep the big ones that I can fillet. And I know that during this early spring, late winter, that those fish start to stage outside of docks that are in X depth. And what I'll do is I will ride by with my side imaging, a community dock or a regular dock, and I'll look up underneath that dock. Let's say it's a community dock because that really gives you, and that's where I fish most because it's easiest to go to a community dock and I can look at a whole bunch of places at one time, I just ride down the community dock with my side imaging on. I may get four, five, six, eight, ten, fifteen 10, 15 slips down on this community dock, and all of a sudden in slip S17, you know, dock S slip 17, I see a giant school of crappy in that particular slip. I look up as I go by, and it shows up. I can see those fish mass up underneath the boat that's parked in that particular slip, I see which one it is, I I take my big motor, I spin around, I come back, I put my trolling motor down, and I uh, spot lock on it, and and I put my 360 in the water, and I start looking underneath the dock. One of the things that I've learned about crappy is you think that they're held up on that one particular dock when you're in a, or that one particular slip when you're in a community dock like that, but rarely do crappy just sit in that one spot they, the whole school will move around and they'll move 30, 40, 50 feet. And with Mega 360, I can be sitting still and I can isolate just the front 180 degrees looking back at the community dock. And I can literally see 
when they move from the slip across the walkway going down the middle to the slip beside it and then come back into the slip next to mine and turn to come back into the slip that I initially stopped on, shoot a jig up in there as I see the first group of them starting to show up. And by the time they in mass get in that, in that deal, I'm already hooked up on a fish. And that is a very <laughs> powerful tool. But That's it amazing. teaches you a lot about utilizing, um, utilizing that technology and using those tools. And I know I've jumped way ahead here because we were talking about the easiest to use, the, the least expensive, just the 2D sonar, and we have the angler that says, I don't need anything beyond that. I don't need the GPS. I just told you why you need the GPS. That's so you can go back to that particular spot that you found and see if there's anything there this time. Or in the ocean, or especially in the ocean, I can more effectively fish it because I just marked it. I go out in the ocean. I mark spots in the ocean. I fish a lot out of Panama City. I mark spots in the ocean. I can go to that spot and I can just sit still in my boat and watch my GPS and see which way the wind and the current is moving me. And I know that those fish are going to be on the lee side of the current almost every time. And so that gives me the opportunity to get on the lee side of the current. I can get barely over the top of the, whatever the wreck is, so that I don't get caught in it because when I drop my weight, my line, my jig, my um, my sinker with my live bait on it or whatever down beside that deal, I want to be on the lee side of it where all the fish are, but I don't want to get caught in it. And I know that that current's going to sweep it just a little bit away from it. But if I'm off of it too much, I'm not going to get bit because I'm in the Sahara Desert now. I'm not where, I'm not where my target is, if that makes sense. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. So you're talking about that Mega 360. I want to take you back to that. Would you kind of describe that as basically like a panoramic shot as opposed to just, you know, a still, like I'm thinking side imaging sounds more like a a still shot where the camera is moving. The Mega 360 is more of a, uh, the camera's staying still, but it's taking a, a panoramic view of what's out there. Yeah, it's like a radar. For anybody who's ever been out on a saltwater boat and they can see the image forming as the as the paddle inside of the radar is shooting out that signal and catching it as it as the paddle comes back around and it's painting it, um, it's kind of it's kind of that same principle. And it gives me it gives me detail and I don't have to be moving whatsoever. I as a matter of fact I would prefer to be sitting still for that application, although I do utilize mine when I'm trolling in the summertime over deep water because I'm looking for giant pods of bait. Sometimes I see fish intermittently, but for the most part, I see big pods of bait, and it's that old, you know, adage that says, I find the birds, the birds find the bait, the bait, the fish find the bait, so I want to find the bait. So if I can see the bait up in front of me and I'm trolling with lead core or I'm waiting to drop down down downlines for fishing for striped bass, you know, or whatever the quarry is that I'm chasing, I literally can see where that bait pot is, and I can turn my boat toward that so that my lines go to it, or where I can drop my bait into it, because when I get to it, that's typically, the fish are typically close behind. All right, let's step back to transducers a little bit. Right at the beginning of the show, you were talking about that transducer with that 20 degree, I guess you would call it a, you know, angle, so to speak, or cone. It's a cone angle. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so that 20 degree angle, I I never knew this before, but you're saying if you're in a hundred feet of water, you're going to be scanning 30 feet of the bottom. About 30, about 33 feet. Yep. Okay. And so when we talk about the transducer, okay, and we're trying to make a decision there, is there anything we can do from a down imaging perspective to increase that that cone? And then secondly, you know, secondly to that question is, how does that translate from a side imaging perspective? What is your effective radius from the boat? Or, or yeah, what's your effective radius? And can you increase that radius? Help us work through trying to choose a transducer based on those considerations. Well, you're, first of all, your units are going to come with, with a transducer that's already fitted to that particular machine, and they're all very similar. You're going to either have a 2D transducer, um, you're going to have a down imaging transducer, 
or you're going to have what we call an all-in-one. It's going to give you your 2D, it's going to give you your DI, and it's going to give you your side imaging all built into one transducer. When you start changing transducers, you're not typically changing transducers unless you're going to something that's really high end for salt water because what you're really doing is you're looking at the different mounting application and that's what's going to determine the different transducer. I want to put one onto the bottom of the trolling motor. I want to put one through the hull. I want to shoot through the hole in a fiberglass boat because I don't want to put a hole in the boat, but I want to be able to hold the bottom while I'm going fast and I have a step hole. You know, those are the kinds of reasons that you would typically uh, pick a transducer. Now, the exception to that would be for a guy who's fishing in really deep water. He needs a uh, one kilowatt or two kilowatt transducer that's going to give him the opportunity to pick up the bottom in very deep water. When I say very deep water, if I go to uh, the coast of Florida and I go anywhere from, oh, I don't know, maybe West Palm Beach South, the Gulf Stream comes in fairly close to shore. So I could go offshore, you know, it depends on, on, on the time of year, but basically I could go offshore five, six, seven miles and I could be in 1,000 to 1,200 feet of water. And that's where you need a higher kilowatt transducer because I want to be able to see target separation. You're not typically fishing bottom in those applications, although you could be if you're fishing for yellow ledge grouper, you know, or you're fishing for something like that. Maybe you're sword fishing fish. for swordfish in the canyons. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but even when you're there, what happens is a canyon could be, could be 400 yards wide that dumps into from 1200 feet to 1700 feet of water and all you're getting, all you see on your 2D sonar is you see this big V shape because the cone is so big down there with that one kilowatt or two kilowatt transducer that it's taking and picking up both sides of it and you're getting an echo and it just looks like a big V on the bottom. It looks like a big crevasse. It doesn't look like a canyon, you know? And so what you're doing is you're trying to determine where you see bait or what depth you see fish so you can take those electric reels and drop those big sash weights that weigh six, seven, eight, ten 10 pounds down to 12 or 1500 feet. So you can get in the zone where you're seeing those swordfish. So it's a totally different application. You're typically going to utilize what comes with the boat uh, well, or what comes with the, with the sonar unit. And you're going to pick your flavor, whether you want 2d sonar, side imaging or down imaging. And sometimes it means that you're going to pick multiples. You may have uh, a down imaging unit with a down imaging transducer built into the foot of your trolling motor if you're a bass or a crappie guy. Um, and you may have a side imaging unit on the back of your boat. And because we can network these units together, I can view on my unit on the bow of the boat, my side imaging if I want to coming off the back of the boat, moving with my trolling motor. You have the ability to make those choices um, with your units as long as they're networked together. So that's a reason to look at if you notice our units, you have something called an N, it'll have an N designator. So it'll be a, a Helix. Right now we're on Gen 4, so it would be a Helix G4N. That's telling me that that unit is networkable. So if I take a G4N uh, side imaging unit and a G4N down imaging unit, I can literally share those technologies between those two units so long as they're networked together with an Ethernet cable. Gotcha. So that's where we're talking about you know, broadband is, I mean, is that the term that was used there? If it's broadband, then it, it's networkable to back to the unit itself? Broadband is talking about, uh, is talking about chirp. It's talking about be able to, instead of just sending out a 200 kilohertz signal, it's, it's about the capability to do chirp. And chirp is almost like a police scanner is the best way I know to, uh, to describe it. Uh, or a scanner on a VHF radio when you're in the ocean. When you're running in the ocean, you know, I don't necessarily go out there with my radio fixed on, on channel 16 or channel 9, which is an emergency channel. I will go out there with it on scan. So it's just scanning across all the channels that are on my machine. So if somebody starts talking on channel 17 or somebody starts talking on channel 7 or whatever it is, my unit stops on that and I get to hear a part of that conversation. I may not know where they are. But if they're talking about catching a particular kind of fish in a particular kind of depth or something of that nature, it may be a little bit of intel that's going to help me on a day that I'm, that I'm not having 
the best of success. But the bottom line is, is that instead of just sending out that 200 kilohertz signal, if I'm if I'm chirping uh, 150 to 220, or in my case, I use a, I do use an airmar transducer because I do uh, I do a, a fair amount of saltwater fishing. I'm using an airmar. Uh, B-175 high wide, and that trans- transducer transmits a chirp signal from 150 to 250. That's 100 different frequencies that it's transmitting. I can listen to all 100 of those frequencies simultaneously. I'm not going to know the difference except for I'm getting an incredible signal, but if I realize that I'm fishing for yellowfin tuna and yellowfin tuna show up really, really good at 220 to 230, I can go in and change my frequency to 220 to 230 and not listen to 150 to 250. I have the ability uh, to do that and to just hone in on a a specific part of that spectrum that that chirp is listening to. Bill, I want to take you back into, you were talking about kilowatts and and you know you may need to upgrade that transducer if you are fishing in really deep water we see a lot of that uh, with our saltwater guys like you say fishing for daytime fishing for swordfish you know you're down there 14 1500 feet of water in a lot of cases uh, and you need to be able to see what's going on another thing that's very common so I'm going to I'm going to speak to my audience uh, a lot here my saltwater guys is guys are running boats they're cruising upwards of 30 miles an hour. In a lot of cases, 50, 60 miles an hour. They're running offshore. They're, they're heading out to fish the ledge. Maybe they're going to grouper fish. Maybe they're going to daytime swordfish. Maybe they're running out to the floaters and they're going to fish for tuna and all the pelagics. But when you're running that fast, what kind of transducer does someone need to be able to, need to choose if they want to be able to mark bottom and potentially mark spots when they're in transit? Uh, you're typically going to choose something that's going to get you to that high end, to that, to that maximum depth that you're going to fish. You might choose something that's going to get you a decent signal at that, at that depth. But like for me, so on my boat, in, in, our, in our new units, the, the Apex, which you probably have, have seen that we have just launched. We're going to start shipping those here in just a couple of three weeks. But the Apex has the ability to duplex. And what that means is on my boat, I have uh, two Airmar B-175s. I've got a B-175 low and I've got a B-175 high wide. The high wide is not going to do much for me in depths much beyond about 500 feet but the cone angle on it is 24 degree. So when I'm running out toward the three by fives out of, out of Panama city, which is about 50 miles out, they're typically 300 to 500 feet. You do have some deeper depths in that same area because it's a, it's like a Canyon in itself. But the bottom line is, is I'm going out and I'm running along, which by the way, I rarely see anybody going 60 miles an hour. The ocean doesn't allow you to do that very much. So I'm running out, I'm trying to conserve fuel, I'm turning out about 3,800, 4,000, 4,200 RPMs. XTO is going to give me about 2.2 miles per gallon. I'm cruising along at 38 miles an hour at those kinds of RPMs or something there about. All of a sudden, I see a little blip on the bottom, uh, a relief. I'm going to touch my finger to my screen on my Solix, and I'm going to drop a waypoint there. I'm going to come off plane in a lot of instances, unless I'm in a hurry to get from point A to point B, I'm going to swing around and I'm going to go back and I'm going to do a ride over on that particular spot utilizing my 2D sonar, my down imaging, and if I'm not too deep, I'm going to look at my side imaging as well because what I just found was something that I didn't even know that existed in that Sahara desert of sand on the bottom. And every time you find even the smallest piece of debris on the bottom in the open ocean like that, the propensity for it to hold the fish is huge. And the fact of the matter is that there are very few people that maybe even saw or found that. It's maybe never even been fished before. And that's where those monster grouper or those monster cobia or those monster whatever come from. And guys that are saltwater fishing, they know exactly what I'm talking about because I've been had many times that I've caught you know, a 30 or 40 pound cobia over some piece of debris that was on the bottom and it was only 60 or 70 feet deep. 
but nobody else knew that it was there. It wasn't a public number. It wasn't on a chart. It wasn't on, you know, my list of whatever I had. When I'm out there fishing and looking for Kobe as an example, I may be riding around slow near shore and I'm looking at my side imaging all the time. And every time I see that shadow, I drop a waypoint. I may not go back and look at it then, but I now have waypoints. And out of Panama City, even though I'm a part-time fisherman out of there, I probably have 8,000 waypoints out of just Panama City. You're just talking using about, the technology. Uh, you're talking about uh, a type of fishing that, that I'm very familiar with. And, and I want to go back to what you said about the cone angle. You mentioned that high wide having a 24 degree cone angle. I would assume that the, that the, the greater the angle, so the wider the angle, the more bottom you're able to scan. Correct. So is it, would a good analogy to put to this be kind of like a scope on a rifle? The higher the power, you know, the more, the farther out you're able to see with clarity. Uh, but what you give up there is that if, you've, if you're trying to look at something that's very close, you're going to be super scanned in. And so you're not going to be able to see, you're not going to have much field of view. So you were saying that du the duplex, you mentioned the high wide and the low, is the low better for shallower water or deeper water? It's better for deeper water. And with the apex, I have the ability to put both of those transducers into individual ports. And I have the ability to get one view utilizing both of those transducers on one machine without any other apparatus to process those signals. The apex has the ability to process the low and the high wide or the high wide and the medium or a transducer that has a low and a high built into the transducer, it can process all that out of that one unit without any type of help. Is that coming through as one image or you have a split screen that you're looking at in that scenario? It's coming through as, as one image. Gotcha. So that kind of ties back into the chirp that you were talking about, being able to process these multiple frequencies and pull it into one image so that from a user perspective, we're just looking at the screen and saying, yeah, there's something. Yep. I love yep. it. You are so correct. What about transom mount versus through hulls? You mentioned that earlier. Does that play into uh, being able to mark at speed? Uh, it, 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 it depends. A lot of times the through hull is because as you get into boats that are over 24 feet long, uh, and this is more applicable to saltwater than it is to freshwater. You don't see many freshwater boats that have a step hull. Um, but the bottom line is, is that uh, with step hulls, your transducer for your 2D sonar, you're using your side imaging and your down imaging when you're off plane, you're off pad, you're going slower. You're going to, you know, to, most outboard engines are going to troll a boat at like 2.8 to 3.2 miles an hour. Okay. So, with a with a um, with a step hull, I can't get a good signal because I don't have clean water. Um, if I put the transducer on the stern of the boat, whether it's a shoot through the hull at the, in, in, in the back of the stern, or whether it's mounted directly onto the stern on the outside, like you would typically do a lot of transducers, it just simply is not going to work. I can even start going at like three or four miles an hour, which is that troll speed, and I'm get, not getting a good signal. And the faster I go over that three miles an hour, the worse that signal starts to look because of what happens to the water movement, given the fact that I've got a step hole. A step hole usually has three steps. The front goes down deeper in the water than the middle, and then the back goes shallower than the middle or the front. So it's stepping down and it's to help that boat conserve energy. It's to help that boat get up on pad faster. It's to help that boat be able to take on a wave better and handle better in uh, rougher waters. All those things are what that hull is, is designed for. So I got to be at the very back of the front of the step on that particular hull. And even on mine with a one kilowatt high wide transducer, if I'm going full speed, which is about 60 miles an hour. It's a big boat. It carries 144 gallons of fuel. I lose the bottom continually because the only way I can get that speed is to trim my engine up enough to give bow lift. And when I give enough bow lift to get that front step out of the water, my transducer is not touching the water anymore. So I lose the bottom. So I have to either trim back down, which is going to slow me down 
to make that hit the water. And as soon as I do, I can see the bottom again, or I just slow down, whichever the case may be, in order to hold the bottom. But that's where I would typically use a through-hole transducer. Now, a bass guy that has a single transom or a, a crappy guy that's fishing in a bass boat, which a lot of crappy guys, uh, fishermen do, th they will put that, that transducer through the hole in the back of the boat because they're going really fast and they don't want to lose the bottom. And the, the one thing that stays constantly in, t in touch with the water on a bass boat type hull is the very bottom of the boat. You've seen a bass boat going down the lake going 72, 74, you know, whatever miles an hour. And what's happening with that boat is it starts to chine walk, meaning it starts to, to wobble from side to side because it has such a little bit of the back of the boat touching the water in order to be, in order to hold the bottom, I got to put my transducer as far back as I possibly can inside the boat and shoot through the hull for that type of application. Now, if I'm a guy that's running a smaller boat, a smaller engine, I'm not going to be exceeding 40 or 50 miles an hour, or I have a straight going down the side of a boat that's going to go maybe, maybe 50 miles an hour. As long as I can get on that straight on the bottom of the hull, I can typically hold the bottom at least enough to be able to hold it going at cruising RPMs, which again is about 4,000 RPMs on an outboard engine. Well, I think you did a really good job of talking about transducers here because what I, what I took away from it was that basically you guys have already done the work to pair the right transducer with the right unit. If you're in one of these special cases, you may want to look at upgrading a transducer for the reasons that we brought up. Let's take this into the unit now and really talk about why someone's going to want to choose what when it comes to unit. You already, you already alluded to that you would definitely recommend going with a GPS fish finder versus a standalone fish finder. Let's, let's bring it back to the network system that you, you brought up because I, I don't think we covered that as well as I would like to because when you were, were breaking down the different frequencies, for the user, they're just looking at a screen. When you start talking about networking two systems together or, or you know, a network system where you've got two different displays, are they able to split those screens? Are, are you always going to be splitting those screens? To explain a little bit about the network system and why somebody would want that. So here's here's the application for the network screen, and I, and again I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna use my boat as the application. So I'm gonna first touch on one thing. A lot of people go, hey, I only need one unit. Why do I need multiple units? And it's not because I want to sell you, or Johnson Outdoors, Humminbird wants to sell you two or three or four units. It's because each one of those units has a different application. It's not even about having redundancy going in the ocean where you have two VHF radios, you have two radars, or you have two, you know, uh, two sonar units with GPSs on them, or you have a compass on the dash or whatever, but it's about the technologies and how you use them. So think about the dash of my boat, 27 foot boat, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I've got two Solix 12s in the dash, one right in front of the steering wheel, which is on any, center console, the steering wheel is going to be on the left side of the console. I've got a Solix 12 right in front of there. I've got a Solix 12 in front of the passenger seat that's adjacent to the, the driver's seat in that boat. And then I've got a Solix 12 that's up on top of the console. So I'm just going to stick with these three. I don't have three units just because I can. I have three units because there's a method to the madness. So because I'm standing at the steering wheel in front of me, the most imperative tool that I can have while I'm standing there running this boat in a lake or the ocean, especially inshore in the ocean, outside it doesn't really matter that much, but I want to be able to utilize my map data. I want to be able to use my GPS and the cartography that I have at hand. So the unit that's directly in front of me, I split map by map. So I got two views on one screen. The view on the left would be a a more zoomed out version so that I'm able to look way ahead of where I'm navigating the boat. The map to the right or on the right screen of that would be zoomed in because I'm trying to follow a contour. I'm trying to get on a waypoint. People don't realize that if I'm zoomed, at, if I'm only zoomed into 200 feet, I can see the waypoint. 
but I'm rarely going to get over the top of the waypoint because I got to be zoomed in enough to be able to hit my mark. And I can't do that until I get to like a 50 foot level or a hundred foot level. I don't, I have no chance of, of, of hitting my mark. So that's what my left screen is. Then my right screen, I have a 2D sonar in one half of it and down imaging in the other half of it. If you recall, I told you that I have a step hall, meaning that my 2D transducer is on the back of the step. That means that that transducer position is midship or right at the front of the console. My side imaging and down imaging transducer, by contrast, is on the very stern of the boat, literally mounted on right in front of the engine. And so there is a lag of what I see on the 2D sonar to what I see on the down imaging uh, sonar by that 15 or 16 or 17 feet, whatever the exact measurement is between there. But it's literally maybe one second or two seconds. So when something shows up on 2D, a fish, as soon as it shows up onto my DI, I know that my boat has just passed over whatever it is. So it gives me an idea of what it is. Then the unit up on the top of my dash is on side imaging. And that's letting me look out to the port and starboard side of the boat and see those fish or those structures that I would have otherwise missed with that 2D view. Having the map in front of me, having the 2D and the DI and the side imaging all there, I'm constantly scanning unit to unit. I'm not only using my chart in front of me when I drop a waypoint, albeit a temporary waypoint, or it could be a permanent waypoint for a piece of structure because I want to be able to navigate to, as close to it as I possibly can without getting hung in it if it's a brush pile or whatever, giving me the best opportunity to catch a fish because that's where those critters live is in that ambush place piece of structure. And the side imaging, if I'm on the side imaging on the top and I stop my side imaging to mark a waypoint, if I want to see side imaging still, all I have to do is wipe my two fingers apart on my Solus screen directly in front of either one of them and choose side imaging. And now I still have side imaging that's live, even though I have side imaging static or stopped on the other unit, because it's still looking at everything continuously, even though I stopped it on the unit on top. And that's the value of having multiple units and having them network together is the value of me being able to use all of those techno technologies like a symphony as I'm out there running my boat and trying to effectively fish that piece of structure. Yeah, you're not having to go over here to do this, step over there to do that. It, it's just all right there. It's all, it's very usable is what I'm hearing. You, you mentioned b being a touch screen. Let's talk about the display a little bit. There's so many different resolutions, so many different size screens. Where, where, how do you pull that all together into a, uh, a decision? You know, I mean, golly, I see some of these screens these days, they're, they're bigger than some of the TVs that I have at my house. So why do you choose one display or another? Well, the, dis the display has to do with the size of the screen in the, in the Helix, in the Helix brands. And you can go to hummingbird.com and you can look at the size of the screens. Uh, you can look at what the resolution is. The number of horizontal or vertical pixels gives you the opportunity to give better target separation and definition on 2D sonar specifically, but also on side imaging and down imaging. I can, excuse me, I can literally see the fins on a fish. I can see, and I can, see, again, I will send you some screen snapshots, but you can literally see the fish structure of a fish. I can tell a tarpon. I can tell a snook. I can tell a striped bass. I can tell some of these species of fish so long as they're turned uh, the, the exact same way of the boat and I pass by and get to look at the entire body of this fish. Remember I told you that it's shooting out that business card width, basically, of signal. And so is, if the fish is turned parallel to my boat, I get a look at that fish as I go down the side of the fish. And the bigger the fish, the easier it is for me to tell what kind of fish it is on side imaging. And that in of itself is some of the stuff that I take into consideration besides how big my wallet is and what I can afford to have or the number of units that I can afford to have on that particular boat. It also has to do with the amount of real estate 
that I have to mount that unit on. If I'm a guy running a flats boat inshore in Mobile Bay, uh, since you're in Alabama or Perdido Key, wherever it is, you know, I'm not going to have the room to put a 15-inch unit. I'm not going to have the room to put a 12-inch unit or a 10-inch unit maybe. I may opt for a 7- or an 8-inch unit um, because, you know, I don't have the real estate to put that other unit on there. On the other hand, if I'm a guy that has a Cobia tower in a 27- or 28- or 29-foot boat or whatever it is, I may have a 10-inch unit up top, and then I may have a 12-inch unit or a 15-inch unit down at the console. And, again, having them network together – I have the ability to do all of those things on the boat from any station on the boat. So that networking uh, capability, if I've got an Altera and I'm a saltwater guy or a freshwater guy with an Altera, I can stow and deploy my motor from anywhere on the boat. I can do it up top in the Cobia Tower. I can do it down at the console. If I'm a guy that's running a Parker that has like a cabin area that you would go into and a door so it's enclosed, I could have another one out on, in the back fishing area, and I could operate my boat back there just like I could operate my boat, go to a waypoint, whatever it is, at the console. And all of those things are sharing those waypoints and sharing those accessory capabilities so long as they're networked together. And all it takes to network them together is an Ethernet cable. And that's what we refer to as the one boat uh, network. We do have some apparatuses that will talk to e- to the units and to each other via Bluetooth. I have my phone connected to my unit. Once I connect my phone to my unit and I have the Humminbird FishSmart app, it literally pulls my entire network. I can go look at my phone and I can see every single object that is connected to my network. I know what the MAC address is. I know what version of software that it's running, and if I want customer service to call me because I have an issue, I can hit the little icon at the bottom that says contact me, and when the person from Humminbird calls me back, they already know what units I'm running. They know what version of software I'm running. They know if it has Mac, if I have Mac addresses, they, that tells them, that gives them a key to knowing what my problem is not so that they can help me figure out what my problem is if I have a problem. And those are some of the things that we give you the capabilities for because we're all fish heads at the end of the day. We all love what we do. We love fishing. We want all these things to be connected together, not because it's cool, but because it gives you more time to go catch fish and it allows us to be able to help you make that product work easier and better. And when it doesn't, it helps us to get under the hood of your unit. Cause I'll call it, if a guy calls into customer service, he says, uh, customer services, what software are you running, Mr. Carson? Oh, I'm running the latest. You just updated it? Yeah. What version is that? I don't know. So you didn't even know how to tell you what version it is, but in his mind, his perception tells you that he is running the latest software. But when I can see under the hood of his unit and I know exactly what software he's running, it helps me to be able to cut to the chase and make that guy a happy fisherman. And yeah. that's some of what we did. I could really see that because this stuff, it's so complicated and you just want to go fish. And so being able to be able to talk to the tech, you know, without having to know what's going on would be huge for me running a Minn Kota with the, uh, the spot lock feature has kept me from having to pull the anchor so many times <laughs> that it saved me a lot of trips to the bow. Now you're telling me that I can actually deploy the Minn Kota from the unit you just saved me some more trips about now here's your next thing. When is this thing going to bring a beer to the tower when I'm sitting, right. in, you know, yeah. if you can get that you're not part, suppo- you're not out. supposed to, you're not supposed to be drinking a beer in the tower. I'm not, I'm not driving. Somebody else is driving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you were in the tower and, and that's usually a one person. So I was, Oh, just, not when you're you know, Cobia fishing. Just... No, we put four or five up there. We're having a good time. Man, that is so cool. It's just that's amazing cool. how y'all have been able to, just it just gets better and better and better and better and and ultimately like like you say it it's about making this thing easier for guys like me and guys like brian who aren't techie we just want to go fish and we want we want to have those features but we also don't want to have to figure it all out you know you're talking about that side imaging and being able to pick up particular details on fish that brings me to the last part of this show which is really trying to choose the best unit 
the best setup, the best network maybe for your type of fishing. And the reason I say that is because it brings to mind a type of fishing that is uh, very common in, in Mobile Bay. And that's, that's running the ship channel up in the Mobile Bay, uh, looking for cobia, looking for blackfish, triple tail, as some people call them. And, and one of the things I've been able to see done with side imaging is to be able to go past a channel marker or a buoy and actually see a blackfish or cobia on that chain, you know, this going down and be able to identify, hey, there's a blackfish 20 feet down. Whereas back in the, you know, before all this technology was there, we would just fish that buoy maybe seven to 10 feet down in the column move on if we didn't catch anything and we were fishing over the top of fish many 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 times they were there we just weren't fishing deep enough and now that i've seen that side imaging we're we're pulling up on structure and i've seen it on ships i've seen it on oil rigs where we're seeing a fish at a certain depth and dropping a bait right to them and getting bit and joe that's a that's a great point and i can take that back to a conversation i had and and i know we were talking before the show even about, you know, I'm on in the market right now trying to find something for my dad. 80 years old, crappie fisherman, technically challenged for sure. And we're still trying to get him to learn how to uh, text message back and forth on, on his iPhone. So definitely technically challenged. But perfect example, last week, and my dad's a really good crappie fisherman. He's kind of known as being a good crappie fisherman in North Louisiana. And he catches six fish. And guys not far from him catch the limit and so my dad is talking to him uh after he and, and they're like well mr seeing how how deep were you fishing and he told them and they're just like man you were three feet three four feet over the fish if you'd have dropped down three or four you'd have been been in them so he is big time in the market we're <laughs> now we're he's, trying now to he's mad <laughs> now he's mad he's mad he was mad when he called he's like okay you've been telling me i've got to get a fish finder let's get started let's figure this out so <laughs> for a guy and that's what i'm wondering for you know there's so many options there's so many different things that you can do with them if i'm a bass fisherman in alabama or if i'm a crappie fisherman break this down where do i need to start Obviously, the sonar, the GPS, the down imaging, and the side imaging, after listening to this conversation, and before this call, I was thinking, oh, my dad doesn't need side imaging. If we just have down imaging and GPS and sonar, he'll be fine. But I think side imaging for him would be a big improvement uh, and very key. So, so which units do a bass guy and a panfish guy where do they need to start? What do they need to be looking for? Side imaging beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, from there, it has to do with their pocketbook, and it also has to do with what they're going to do with it later. Because if they plan on connecting up more units to it at some juncture down the road when they get their inheritance or they get a birthday opportunity or whatever it happens to be, they want to have the opportunity to do that. I would I would definitely get side imaging. If you if you're not a person that's a that's a big technology person, um, I would probably look at a Helix versus a uh, Solix uh, or an Apex. Unless I'm a guy who is going into the salt water, and I think I might use that second transducer. I mean, you have some savings from it because, like, as the Apex, it's not just bigger; it has higher resolution. It has twice the number of pixels. The Solix, all the Solix units have a little over a million pixels. The, the Apex in a similar size has over 2 million pixels. So it's giving you higher resolution. Um, it's it's kind of like getting a 4K TV instead of getting a 720 TV or a 10, you know, 1028 or whatever. Um, it's giving you the opportunity to get that higher resolution and then giving you the opportunity to connect up those other units and utilize effectively that unit with another unit instead of having to start all over from square one. If you're trying to use the, you're trying to use your unit and you want to connect, you want to be, you want to have connectivity between your trolling motor and your unit. Is there a line of, of your electronics, say the, you know, the Helix or the Solix that won't do that? No, they both will do it so long as you have that N designation. That N 
tells me that it's networkable. So my trolling motor, you know, got, got, a lot of guys saw the tr when the trolling motors came out, whether it was the Ultrax or the Altera or what have you, then they would go out and buy it because they wanted that one feature. And that one feature was what? Spot lock. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be able to spot lock on that particular location so they could fish it effectively. So th that was all they asked. And they just wanted to go get spot lock. Now what we're seeing is we're seeing that the, the overwhelming share of motors that are sold are sold with iPilot Link because the iPilot Link is what all of a sudden opens up this massive universe by an Ethernet cable uh, plugged into the back of the unit or into a five-port switch if you have multiple units and you need multiple ports. It gives you access to all of the tracks. It gives you access to all of the waypoints. It gives you access to the cartography that's in the unit so I can do follow the contour, so I can go to a waypoint, so I can set a route on the unit by going and putting my cursor at the, at the very end of the point and saying go to, and then I can move it back up the point a little ways and say go to and add that as a, as a, as a uh, piece of the route and then move on back up by the shore and say go to and add that to a, to a third leg of the route. And so my trolling motor goes to that first point, it beeps, it turns, it goes to the second point, it beeps, it goes to the third point, it beeps. It just continues doing those things out of my unit because it can, because I opted to get the link version, which gives me the one boat network. That's too cool. So I want to go back to what Brian was saying. Brian, what I heard him say is, sounds like for your father with limited tech, technological experience, you know, limited tech abilities, he's going to want to choose that helix, right? The helix is going to be a little better for him. Yeah. Bill, are there any considerations, especially we're talking about, you know, guys like Brian's dad with regards to touch screens or buttons? You know, I, I know there are a lot of people say, I, I don't want to touch screen or I do want to touch screen. Are those available on all the different units or are there certain units that, that have them and don't? You only, you only have cross touch on the Solix line of uh in the apex line of our units uh families you have only button on the helix uh side of the house and both the apex and the solix you have the ability to go back and look at things in history so as i mentioned early on in this conversation something falls off the screen it's gone i can't tell you know i can't see it anymore i don't have to go back and find it because i can mark it you can mark whatever you see on your side imaging or on your down imaging. Most people don't realize this, but if I'm using my side imaging and I see something on there, I can touch the screen on the Solix or move my cursor over to it on the Helix and look at the bottom of the screen. It'll tell me what the depth was at that location. It'll tell me how far from my boat that it is to go to that location. It will tell me what heading I need to go on to go right back to that very location that I've just marked or that I have my cursor on. That's amazing. And I think about that too, from the saltwater perspective, I've fished with spot lock out there and, and with a, a, a boat that is not connected, you know, we're just saying, all right, there's a spot. And then we're putting the troll motor over and holding our position. And then inevitably, you know, you, maybe they stop biting and, and the, the reef, you know, it may be bigger than your boat. So you want to try a little different angle. You want to get over a little bit and, and move to a different location. And being able to just say, go jog over here, jog over there, or plug in a different set of coordinates. I don't know why you wouldn't want that. Is it just a price consideration thing? Just a price consideration. You know, there are people out there that are never, that are never going to beat the shore, you know, but the guys out there that are going to beat the shore in the spring of the year when the fish are spawning in your particular lake, whether it's crappy or whether it's bass or whether it's perch or whether it's walleye or whatever it happens to be, you know, the, the, if, if you don't want to stand up there and have to drive the boat with your foot on the trolling motor, or you don't want to, you don't want to stand there and keep having to pick up that lanyard from around your neck and push the little right button to turn it a little more right or the left button to turn it a little more left. And you just want to follow the shoreline and you want to stay X feet out of it. I can put my Lake master chart or in the saltwater, my coast master chart in there. I can put my cursor over to what's called the zero line, which is basically the shore full pool line. And I can say, I can hit go to, and then I can say, follow the contour and I can pick anything up to, up to 300 feet away from it. I, if I can cast a hundred feet, 
I can tell my trolling motor to follow the shoreline and stay 100 feet away from it, and it's going to follow the shoreline staying 100 feet away from it until my battery dies or I tell it to stop, whichever comes first. And That's crazy. And that is the value <laughs> of iPilot Link. I just sent both of you guys some screen snapshots and a couple of other things that you guys might want to utilize whenever you do some sort of a link to your blog for people that are listening so that they can kind of see illustrated some of the things that I'm talking about. I sent you the pictures from the Humminbird app. For those listeners out there that have a Humminbird already, if you haven't downloaded the Humminbird app, go to to your um, Apple store or go to to the Android store and download um, the Humminbird Fish Smart app. And then go into your Bluetooth settings on your unit and pair your phone to your unit and all of those objects will populate uh, into, that, uh, into that app and you now have it all right there. If you need to do an upgrade, the upgrades for the Helixes are not typically very big. You could plug your phone into a power source have it on your phone and, and literally update your unit from your phone. You don't even need an SD card to update your unit. You can do the same with the Solix, but most of the Solix updates are, are huge. They're like six, 700 megs. Uh, they're just under a gig. And to transfer that as big of files across a Bluetooth network is, uh, is pretty laborious. Well, Bill, I'm going to break this thing down and try to really – pull it all into what I learned from today. And what I'm hearing from you is, is that for, for a guy who wants buttons, maybe is not th that tech savvy, doesn't want to get that deep in the weeds with it. He's probably going to want to look at something like a, a helix for a guy that likes the tech, wants the touch screen. He's going to want to look at something like a Solix. And then your newest model that's coming out is the, is the apex. And what the Apex gives you the ability to do is, is really duplex and work together in, uh, with all the different technology that y'all have currently. Is there anything else that the Apex does that's brand new? Well, again, the Apex has a much higher resolution. It's, t it's 1920 by 1080 instead of 800 by 1080. Um, it's a low profile machine. So for those that like to have that sexy looking dash and they don't want it sticking out from the dash, it's very, um, low profile. It has dual channel chirp sonar. So it has that ability to do the dual channel. It also has dual ethernet ports and it has, uh, HDMI in and HDMI out. So if you want to send the weather radar from your phone and you want to view it on your unit, you have the ability to do that. If you have Netflix on your phone and you want to send it to your to one of your units uh, and watch the football game while you're fishing or have it in the background, instead of watching it on your phone, you have the capability to do that so long as you have the accessory to connect it up to the Apex unit. But if you're just going to connect a trolling motor to it and, another, and if you want to use a trolling motor and a radar and um, and have a second unit because you have dual unit uh, um, Ethernet ports on there. You don't need a five port switch. You could plug each one of the you could plug the you could use one of the ports to connect the two units together. You could connect the radar up to one unit, the trolling motor up to the other unit. Bingo! You don't, you you now have a network and you have the network all self contained just between what's inside of those two boxes. So, Bill, this is a ton of information. You've done a great job of breaking it down into the, here's the technical jargon, but here's what it means to you as an angler. I feel like I'm ready to make a decision for the most part based on the kind of fishing that I'm going to be doing. But I can see Brian's dad sitting there, you know, and he gets this box for Christmas, and then he's going to go, okay, now what? For a guy that got a, a new unit, a new system, and they are wanting – to get the 101 and, and get this thing out on the water and start using it, what do they do? Okay, so here's what I would recommend. The first thing that I would recommend doing is everybody knows what YouTube is. Um, everybody knows what the internet is. Um, you can go to humminbird.com if you don't know what specific unit you want or mincota.com if you don't know what specific trolling motor that you want. And there's a plethora of information in there that's going to ask, that's going to answer those frequently asked questions. How do I pick shaft link? Um, what size unit do I want? Uh, what kind of transducer? There's just all of these questions are answered in the uh, support section under FAQs. 
uh, are frequently asked questions. Once you've got that unit, you've figured all this out, you've got the unit on your boat, you're trying to figure out how to operate it, go to YouTube and type in Humminbird TV. No G in Humminbird. It's Humminbird. So go type in Humminbird TV. It's a channel on YouTube. Click on subscribe to. Now you can go into that channel and you can look up whatever you want to. I want to know how to save a screen snapshot off of the Solix. I want to know how to mark a waypoint. I want to know how to save my waypoints. Whatever it is you want to do, you can type in uh, that particular uh, question. Just start typing in the first words of it. And all of these videos have, have what's called a meta tag in them that's going to make them pop up. And you can watch that YouTube video and you can see somebody uh, doing it on the water. They'll show you how to do it. Sometimes it's in a lab uh, setting, but most of the time it's on the water. It's some angler who's done it. You can do the same thing on Facebook. You can do the same thing on Instagram. Type in uh, hashtag uh, Solix or hashtag Helix. Uh, and do a look up on those things. You're going to find all kinds of videos out there where people are showing the users how to utilize those capabilities on those units. And then watch it at the, at the retailers. Watch at your local uh, tackle store, your local boat dealer, because those guys are constantly, I'm talking pre-COVID now, and hopefully we're going to see this happening again really soon, is there's all kinds of instruction that takes place where some person such as myself comes into a Bass Pro or some person such as myself comes into a Cabela store or some person such as myself comes into Jim Bob's boat dealership and does a seminar for at least an hour and then answers those questions uh, for those individuals. Don't be afraid to contact customer service. Our customer service people are really good at both Minn Kota and at Humminbird. And they'll be able to help you along the way with those technical questions. And I already told you that you have the app there. They're going to know what unit you have. They're going to know what software you're running in. They're going to know what the capabilities are of that unit and those softwares before they ever take your call to start answering your question so long as you connect it up to that app. That is great. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys uh, about this because – None of us at Johnson Outdoors take fishing lightly. We think it's the greatest sport in the world. And um, thank you a bunch for allowing us to participate in this exercise with you. Well, Bill, you've done a great job, man. I, I feel like I've learned a bunch. I, I feel like Brian, you know, I think he's probably knows what he needs to go get now. And, uh, man, I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us and uh, helping. Hey, it's going to be the last show of 2020 for us. Uh, we definitely uh, appreciate you joining us and hopefully next time we got some marine electronics questions uh, we're going to bring you back on and we'll talk again and by that time you maybe you'll have that beer thing figured out sounds sounds great uh, send me a link to it and we'll try to make sure that that gets added to uh, to the FAQ stuff so that when folks are uh, asking those questions they can come listen to the podcast and pick up maybe a few tidbits of things that they have uh, questioning in their mind so thanks a bunch you guys have a very Merry Christmas. Stay safe and uh, look forward to 2021. Awesome, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, what a great show. And man, just uh, that guy obviously knows his stuff. And I was really glad at the end that you brought up the, you know, the how to, what, what do you do when you get this unit? Because that's one of the things and that I think of when I go back to thinking about my dad is I can see him getting this new unit, putting it on his boat and just sitting there staring at it and start just tapping buttons and get frustrated and go back to doing it the same old way. So I don't need this thing to catch fish, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so having that YouTube out there is, is phenomenal. We've got guys uh, that call into the Alabama freshwater report that they own, they guide fishing trips daily, but they also guide um, people that, that have a new unit. They offer yeah. a service where if you've got a new unit and you want to really know how to use it, and apply it to the type of fishing you're doing, come get in the boat with us for a half a day and we'll show you how to do it on the water. So those resources are out there as well. But the YouTube sounds like a good, that's a good option too for people that might not know how to locate someone like that. Yeah, I love that idea because, and I've said it time and time and time again, you know, part of the reason that we started this podcast network was because guys like you and me, we all had a mentor 
growing up that really kind of helped us figure it all out. And a lot of people don't get that. But if you go to your local guides and charter them for a day, charter them until just keep chartering them until they are, you know, you can learn so much more from them in a day of fishing than you could do on your own in weeks and weeks and weeks of fishing spend a week fishing with them and then go get your boat and go get your electronics because they're going to be able to show you here's how I'm using it to fish this fishery that we're fishing that you're going to want to fish here's what's necessary here's what isn't and and hopefully listening to a guy like Bill kind of break down the technology but then the usefulness of it is helpful as well absolutely and we talk about that on the show all all the time with with these guys who are, are charter captains and and doing uh, trips daily is it's like guys book a trip with these guys not just to have a great day on the water and catch fish but it's a tool i mean you're it's a learning experience that you can take back to your home lake it's as important to me as you know we all go out there and buy tackle we buy the the boat we buy the rod and reels but if you don't know what to do with it if you don't know how to use it and how to use it in certain scenarios you're just taking a chance and, and, and trying to get lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you go with these guys and book a, book a trip with them, you've learned stuff for a lifetime. Yeah, no doubt, man. Well, I hope that this show was helpful. I know it's a lot of technical jargon to break down and, uh, but I feel like Bill did a great job of, of that and really breaking it down to the user and what they're going to need that for, how that applies to on the water uh, functionality. Hope you guys got something out of it as well. And may hey, man, you know, this is going to go out on all three channels. And I just want to say thank you to everybody that's listening because they're, they're the reason that we're doing this. Hopefully it'll help you get out on the water, have more great days, you know, out on the water, uh, with your family. That's what it's all, all this stuff, all this technology. It, it, the thing that's cool to me when you break it down fundamentally, all this technology that's out there, every bit of it, whether it's hunting, fishing, you know, there's so much. It's really all gets back to spending quality time outdoors with the people that you love, you care about. And it's just trying to facilitate that. And man, how far we've come, you know, talk to like what they're doing oh, now with these electronics. It's, it's amazing. Crazy. It's going to be amazing to see what comes from it. Well, guys, that's going to wrap it up this week. Have yourselves a Merry Christmas and a, uh, a prosperous new year. We're going to see you guys on the, on the flip side. Hope you stay safe uh, over the holidays, catch some fish, get out in the woods, do some hunting. I know I will. See y'all in 2021. See ya. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters. And also brought to you by Test Calibration. Test Calibration is your source for sales and service of diesel turbochargers and fuel injection systems since 1976. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. Also brought to you by Advanced Transmission in Spanish Fort. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251 626 6061 or check them out online at www.advanced transmission.com. And also brought to you by SunSell. For quality John Deere equipment affordably priced, visit your neighbors at SunSell. Visit your local SunSell and check them out on the web at www.sunsouth.com. And also brought to you by Daycool Heating and Air. The pros at Daycool have been servicing Mobile and Baldwin counties for over a decade. Contact them at 251-633-5121 or check them out online at www.daycoolair.com. They are license number AL07028. And also brought to you by Fish Bites. Fish Bites don't stink or leave a stink on hands and anything else. They don't require bait buckets or ice to stay fresh while you fish. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits and tackle at fishbites.com. Also brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. This is Captain Richard Rutland, and this report is brought to you by Cold-Blooded Fishing. You can find us at www.coldbloodedfishing.com.